Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming, especially those of you who have been, been before. Um, it's like a week-long sentence for some of you. Uh, but thank you ever so much for attending. And thanks also to those who are uh, tuning in online. All 15,000 of you, I've been led to believe. Um, it, might have been, it might have been 15, the figure I was given. Um, I'm going to talk very generally about Oxford's experience during the Second World War. Um, and well, I suppose try some things out on you. And I'm going to begin by reading a poem called A People's Peace for Two Persons. You and I must shortly sever all the bonds of our endeavor to be sharp and self-sufficient. Was our coast defense sufficient or did truthful bonds endanger attempts by our reasons governments to make us grow stranger? We, with pleasure masochistic, learned each detailed death statistic due to my hot brain guns kinder than your accurate range finder since more sudden yet as certain to mean the collapsed brick shelter, the bleeding blackout curtain. To replace these shared sensations, no romantic League of Nations or precise federal union, no world churches chased communion, overturning our ruling classes whose wars for abstract thinking's profits formed our lives of farces. Flesh's frontier, forts demolished, racial wounds by both abolished. Each consumes without trade fracture, others novel manufacture. But my dear, though slack peace plighting, may not we who fought to love, fight again for love of fighting. Written in December 1940 by an undergraduate at Queen's College, um, who was there from 39 to 41 on a short two year war degree, and who was then killed with the East Surrey Regiment at Monte Cassino in 43. I just thought I'd share that with you because I find it a beguiling poem. Don't really understand half of it, um, but, uh, but, but find it quite, quite excellent. So, to give an overview, of some aspects of Oxford's experience during the war. The blackout plunged the city into a Stygian darkness unknown since medieval days. Emergency water tanks appeared in Radcliffe Square and Merton College Grove in case the city's vital infrastructure was knocked out. A rifle range appeared in Wadham College's gardens and the Warden of New College, volunteering for war work as Oxford's great and good did their bit, was knocked over and killed on a blacked out London street while visiting from Oxford to assess the claims of conscientious objectors. The new Bodleian was turned over in its entirety to war purposes, providing storage deep underground for treasures from Oxford, the capital, and places all over Britain special rooms for cartographers preparing D-Day invasion maps, and accommodation for a Red Cross team sending parcels to British prisoners of war. It also housed an air raid shelter for over a thousand people and was home to a blood transfusion center, supplying the needs of the Radcliffe Infirmary and other local hospitals. Wellington Square lost its iron railings as did St. John's entire North Oxford estate, Manchester College's Arlosh Quad, and a host of buildings across the city. Evacuees from Brit Blitz London crowded into cinemas in Oxford to awake housing. The well-to-do of Boars Hill and North Oxford suspected of reluctance to take children from less privileged backgrounds. C.S. Lewis patrolled the city's streets with a home guard rifle and was inspired to write the Chronicles of Narnia by three evacuee children who lodged at his house, the Kilns, at Risinghurst in the east of the city. His brother Warning, meanwhile, chugged around the Chawa aboard his cabin cruiser as part of the Upper Thames Patrol, the UTP as it was known, a riverine civil defense unit 
founded by the MP for Abingdon, Sir Ralph Glynn, and irreverently known as Up the Pub. Very much a home guard kind of outfit along the water. German bombers droned overhead as they made their way to the industrial Midlands. Oxford's population unaware that Hitler had apparently spared their city in order to use it as his capital when he arrived on Der Tag. Rather, Oxford citizens were mindful of the destruction visited upon nearby Coventry and the Baedeker raids on historic cities like their own elsewhere in Britain. Also of the fact that Oxford's, Oxford's factories churning out military equipment and repairing hundreds of downed fighters to be returned to frontline service presented very much a legitimate target for the Luftwaffe. They operated ARP watchtowers atop Woolworths on Corn Market and All Saints on the High Street, what's now Lincoln's Library, and trained on stirrup pumps and fire engines housed in college quads across the city and municipal buildings such as the town halls and hall gates. Fire watchers and aircraft spotters took to the rooftops across the city, at depressed steelworks in Cowley, as at St John's, town and gown in equal peril. As well as the threat from the air, the prospect of ground attack was real too in the early years of the war. Oxford squatting a thwart a potential invasion route for German troops advancing on London or towards the Midlands. In the amazing atmosphere of the invasion of summer of 1940, with the British Army temporarily immobilized and partially disarmed following the Dunkirk evacuation, its heavy weapons abandoned on French beaches, it was thousands of Canadian troops who arrived in Oxford and parts of the county surrounding it to meet the threat of potential German attack, flooding the city centre at night to drink and pinch unattended cars and bicycles. Later, the Americans arrived as Oxfordshire became a major base for Allied air power and pre-D-Day preparations. They jitterbugged in the Great Hall of Rhodes House and took over the Churchill Hospital, opened by the Duchess of Kent in 1942, after having been initially conceived as a hospital for Oxford wounded in the event of air bombardment. As the enemy air threat receded, the skies above the cities were dominated by the activities of the RAF and the US Army Air Force and their machines based at the airfields that really proliferated across the county, probably more air bases in this county than any other. Like every other British city, Oxford bore the hallmarks of home front hardship, from gas masks to ration books, food coupons, and of course, the strictly enforced blackout. We'd often get messages going around the university to bursters from the registrar saying, your blackout's rubbish. We've been told by the authorities that you have to sort it out. People ate powdered eggs, were denied bananas, and knitted balaclava helmets for merchant seamen. Tree, tree trunks were stacked, ready to block roads should the invader come and air raid shelters appeared in understairs cupboards in people's homes and in underground spaces of city buildings, such as the cellar of the Grapes Pub on George Street, the Norman Crypt of St. Peter in the East on Queen's Lane, now the library of Teddy Hall. There were dig for victory allotments in the university parks and the little quad by the examination schools overlooking the East Gate, Port Meadow as well, and scores of plots on places like Oriel College's sports ground. Public and private spaces such as the Southfield Golf Course and Cutterslow Park were also turned over to the patriotic production of vegetables. In the Provost lodgings of Worcester College, with views out over the lake, the wives of Dons and Vickers and other gentlefolk rolled bandages and made slings and swaps for the Red Cross. The Home Guard was popular with those too old or too young to join up. So the VC himself 
before he dies in 1942 as a private in the Home Guard. Um, Captain Frank Packen, Packenham, later Lord Longford, commanded a Home Guard company after having been, um, after having left the regular army. And his company prowled around Christchurch Meadows from headquarters in the college garages and Salter's Boatyard, which then was in what is now the head of the River Park. Armed with two two rifles and large sticks, recalled Stanley Lester, who had recently graduated from the Fifth Oxford from the Fifth Oxford St Michael's Troop Boy Scouts to join the Home Guard. Its soldiers patrolled the Broadwalk, looking for enemy parachutists, bearing orders to give them stick if they landed. Doing their bit too, scientists from the university's chemical laboratories sought to perfect the Molotov cocktail in case the invader came, throwing dozens of different mixtures against the rock face of a Headington quarry, discovering that a 60-40 split using petrol and coal tar worked best, and that rope slings improved accuracy and range. Students fit for active service took shortened two-year degree courses, and underwent military training at the same time. As the male undergraduate population plummeted, Oxford brimmed with military officers on short training courses. University staff also left for the forces or for government work, for example, as we've heard in the week, at places such as Bletchley Park, but many other places as well. The production of intelligence particularly under the auspices of the Admiralty run into services topographical department based in the School of Geography at Manchester College and brimming all across other parts of that area, but also the new Bodleian in two, was a feature of Oxford's war and its intelligence contribution. Meanwhile, the university's bigwigs advised ministers or conducted studies on war and post-war challenges as a great deal of effort was put into trying to win the peace once the fighting had ended. Academics and civil servants worked on post-hostility planning, influencing government thinking as it sought to address challenges such as rising Soviet influence and the return of British rule to territories conquered by the Japanese. Anticipating the post-war world, Government sought ways to honour pledges made to the public regarding social and economic security. Their attempts to win the war on want, supercharged by the experiences of conflict and the demands it placed on ordinary citizens. So William Beveridge, resembling as someone put it, a gargoyle thatched with white hair, erratically performed his duties as master of UNIV while compiling the report on social reconstruction that would come to bear his name, known to wicked colleagues as Mein Kampf. Sir Henry Tizard, president of Magdalen from 42, another largely absentee head of house, some of his colleagues felt, was a major player in wartime scientific work of national importance, as was Sir Frederick Lindemann, Churchill's great chum, professor of experimental philosophy, and director of the Cavendish Laboratory, becoming one of Churchill's most influential confidants and probably one of the most powerful scientists the nation has ever seen. Helping as he did, in particular with Oxford relevance, to shape its contributions to war work, including things like work on the atom bomb and radar. At the Radcliffe Infirmary on the confluence of St Giles and the Woodstock Road, City of Oxford Police Constable Albert Alexander became the first person to be treated with penicillin as major advances in the drugs development were made by the team led by Howard Florey, head of the Dunn School of Pathology on South Parks Road. Defining facets of Oxford life was suspended because of the war. The annual Oxford Cambridge boat race was cancelled though in some years was held unofficially on stretches of the Thames nearby, and there were no official athletics varsity matches for seven whole years. There were no commemorative balls. Affluent students in most colleges lost the privilege of hosting nice little lunch parties in their rooms. 
and the unfortunate inhabitants of Maudlin's deer grove were culled, college fellows taking haunches of venison home with them. Import restrictions, more seriously, reduced St John's vintage port stocks to such an extent that consumption was confined only to special occasions. One such special occasion was designated as being the anniversary of the Battle of Alamein in 43. The fellows agreeing that the battle had lasted for eight days. It wasn't just the trimmings of university life that were affected by the war. The very stones themselves were enlisted as national emergency shrunk academic life and took over buildings as well as people's time and energy in a really all encompassing war. Students were ejected from their staircases and dons from their common rooms as college and university real estate was requisitioned by the government to be occupied by an army of civil servants evacuated from London because of the blitz and an overflow of bureaucrats and clerks called into being by total war. Foreign Office, the Ministry of Food, the Ministry of Information all had a presence in Oxford, as did the Admiralty, the War Office, the Air Ministry, MI5. Further swelling Oxford's extraordinary wartime population, thousands of military personnel passed through on courses or as patients were hospitalized as a result of active service, including the 13,000 individuals treated at the head hospital at St. Hughes. There were then branches of the military that set up shop in Oxford and remained for the duration. In addition to the city's own barracks and infantry training facilities that expands now to develop to, to, to encompass the Slade, they include the Naval Intelligence Division and the Army's Intelligence Corps. The university's press, 90% roughly of its capacity devoted to war work, printed secret military documents and invasion maps, as well as propaganda publications, such as the Oxford pamphlet on the war on world affairs series, gentle propaganda retailing at, retailing at sixpence a pamphlet and shifting over six million copies worldwide. Now, what I'd like to do is to go into some of these aspects in a little more detail. I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact and, and frustrated by the fact I can't cover everything that I, I'm hoping to cover in what I hope to produce at the end of this research. But I'll go into one or two things. Um, but first of all, just to explain my interest in this, I, I was uh, struck when at New College by the fact that the rather squat, undistinguished college library was a memorial to the First World War dead, which only opened in 1940, and that, that, that sort of lodged in my mind. And then when I was at Mansfield, I remember getting some of the nice little college postcards. Um, one of them showed a thick black line across the window in the library. When I inquired of the librarian, I'm a general. <laughs> She told me it was only it was a, an only recently removed blackout pellet, and so from that point, many many years ago, I always had this idea of maybe having a, a closer look at the university, predominantly the city as well, predominantly the university and the war, um, and the fact that doing so was a relatively easy thing because this is a place full of archives. Colleges have archives. The National Archive have archives of military units that were based in colleges. Colleges tend all to publish, as we know, their college records or chronicles, whatever they call them. And, do you know, if you go through 70 or 80 years worth of them, you're going to find a story or two written by someone who was up during the war or visited at some point. And, of course, the fact that a lot of people who were around at the time were likely to be the kind of people who were going to write things down. There were going to be memoirs and diaries, low hanging fruits of published things. Also, I think very importantly, benefiting from work that had already been written. So, for example, um, Malcolm Graham in the early 90s wrote a, a, a brilliant book on Oxfordshire and the war, um, which, of course, featured the city and used lots of Oxford City Council archives, lots of newspaper archives. You then have the enormous efforts of the large bunch of scholars who worked on the Oxford University official history. So the volume eight, edited by Brian Harrison, 
in particular, you know, you look at any chapter on the JCR or sports or you know, buildings, and you go through all of that, and there's just loads of things falling out of it relating to the war that can then be brought together, as well as, of course, as a wonderful chapter on Oxford in the Second World War by the late Paul Addison. So already a rich environment of sources to, to, to be worked on and, and, and with and hopefully added to a little bit by other historians. One of the things that I'm very keen to try and do in the book, well, I'm not going to go into it today, but just give you a sense of some things, because I think they're interesting in general, is, is I'm very, very keen to give a sense of what Oxford was like in the 30s and 40s. So to start by just saying, what was the town like? And because one of the things that really struck me is how different it is, even those of us, and I'm sure that pretty much everyone in this room is really familiar, if I blindfolded you all, you could find your way down to that street and where the high street was and all the rest of it. But even to those of us who know the place very well, I think that if we were beamed back, time travel a fashion, we'd be really surprised by how different it was, like any other place in the country or the world, nothing unique to Oxford. But the fact, for example, that so much of the Oxford we know now wasn't built then, massive building boom in the 30s in particular and the fact that lots of what was there at the time isn't there now which was one of the things i found architecture so many new buildings in colleges but also you know like george streets you know sort of empty yeah, all over the all over the, the city the science area the university parks and what have you um a great deal of new building and then of course we add to that is the fact that it's only in the 20s and 30s that it's being, it's being transformed by the county works, by the motor industry. So a sense that it was, it was, it was a, a growing city, but also that places that were there then aren't there anymore. So think about say the cattle market in Gloucester Green. Think about St. Ebbs and St. Thomas's and these inner city <clears throat> residential areas, which simply no longer exist. Horse-drawn transport on the streets, a very, very common sight. The nature of the shops and the premises. I was looking the other day at, um, I think it's KFC. And it's like, well, it used to be a furrier's. When I'm writing about it, it's all moleskin trousers and things like that. So just the, the different high streets of, of Britain. And so I want to try and give a sense of that. And also, I think, the smallness of the city um, and the fact that so much of its development, like the, for some like Betjeman, the hated expansion into, into Motoropolis, or whatever he calls it, the whole Cowley thing, the incorporation of the villages, this is a recent thing. Um, its population is a third then of what it is today. But even beyond that, if we're looking at the, the archetype Oxonian, I think they'd be blown away by the cloister, single sex, minute nature of college communities. So you have colleges with hardly any fellows and hardly any students. Add to that going to chapel, always wearing gowns and those kinds. So, so that's one thing I want to, I'm beginning with in the book is to try and give a sense of, of a bit of what, what Oxford was like at the time, to so I suppose set the scene. And like I said, it's nothing, you know, none of this is trying to puff up Oxford, it'd be the same in any other part of the UK. Um, and then to go on and look at the 1930s, it's a very important period as, 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 as kind of a backdrop to the war, is to look at this just incredible maelstrom of political activity and thinking and worry and fear, interest in the League of Nations, in what's happening in the Spanish Civil War, whole rise of the Nazis thing, also mostly visiting the city. So, so that kind of atmospheric of a, of a time where no one can afford to really not be political anymore. Um, and adding to that, of course, one of the major um, aspects of Oxford War, which becomes really important in terms of scientific achievement, is the 1930s immigration of refugees. So you've got you know, people like Lindemann are going out and actually sort of touring parts of Germany and, and, and trying and then setting up things like the Academic Assistance Council. So when the laws are passed by the Germans in 1933, they're chucking loads of people out of universities. There's movements to try and get them over here. And of course, the rest of the UK. This is not a unique Oxford being extra special thing at all. But so that influx of people, which carries on through the war, before we even get to the thousands and thousands of British evacuees coming from London or Ashford in Kent and other places like that, um, is really quite an exceptional part of that story in the 30s setting. Um, and that's before we get to things like, I'm not going to go into great with the whole scientific and medical contribution, the contribution of, of Oxford people to 
war-related literature or theological thinking or morale-boosting BBC broadcasts and all that kind of stuff. So that's just a bit of background on, on some areas that I'm interested in looking at. Excuse me. It's just the little dentist cups. So, so in its own right, I think Oxford presents a compelling study of the interconnections between a university and national and international affairs during wartime. And you could do this study elsewhere, uh, Cambridge, you know, other university places. It permits us to observe the network nature of matters of state, the enormous importance of research, and the impact of academic activity on government policy. One of the things that's very interesting is just the extent to which across UK higher education, never mind Oxford, if you look at what what was supposed to be the official history of education in the second which doesn't actually get published properly in the official HMSO series. Um, this talks about the way in which there's been a coordinated government approach across British universities and higher education set up in the late 1930s. Uh, very much so, saying over there, those of you who, who, were, who attended things and remember how there was a coordinated learning from the First World War experience approach to how you were going to use the benefits of academia harness them to the war effort and also how you were then going to try and preserve academic spaces you weren't just going to try and ring as much as you could to make bombs you were also going to be thinking about the importance of the humanities about civilization and the role of universities and what they do in winning the peace never mind just the war always acting as part of a national campaign involving other centers of expertise often coordinated by government as it connected its own, for example, laboratories and research establishments to those of universities across the British Isles. Oxford contributes to things like the development of radar and the atom bomb and participates in new research on things like plastic surgery and therapeutic wonder drugs. And I think the important thing here, atom bomb is a very good example of it's a cracking story. Um, yet Oxford isn't the most important British university involved in that research. And as someone once said of the more important Cambridge research on the bomb compared to the enormity of the US led Manhattan project. The Cambridge endeavor was like parking a bicycle next to a juggernaut so to so that sense of perspective when we talk about you know Oxford and penicillin and this it's just for me as a, as a writing and, and looking at this stuff is not to sort of um you know sort of uh, um, um, over egg um, 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 what Oxford does or to delink it from what's happening in other parts of the, of, the, of, of, of the country and indeed of the world. Um, but nevertheless, supporting the Boffins War, um, it plays its part also in code breaking, the gathering of vital intelligence, um, famously assembled at Bletchley Park. Oxford experts furnish Winston Churchill with vital statistical data, one of the achievements of Frederick Lindemann as Lord Charwell, as this like chief scientific advisor, stroke best buddy, who can kind of get anywhere he wants to go, is, is, is forming the statistical department that Churchill develops at the Admiralty and then takes with him into government. So there's a set of only about eight or nine people who will give Churchill the figures and the ammunition to then reach across any ministry in government and say, no, I don't think you're doing enough. I've got the figures here that say that, you know, aircraft production should be up here, but it's only there. Um, like their peers in other places, Oxford scholars, some of them prominent public figures, many of them not, helped lead the charge also towards the sunlit uplands of the post-war world, producing definitive documents on the future of British society and the social contract between government and the people, contributing also to a revolution in state and university education. So it's not just beverage report, the whole Nuffield survey. So, I mean, so things like you've got people doing, people like Marjorie Perrin, doing really important commissioned work on the future of colonies. So in the war ends, they're going to be new, we're already rolling out new policies towards the colonies in terms of development and welfare. So you've got these social scientist experts working on that during the war. You've also got things with the Nuffield surveys like um, um, doing research into uh, pregnant women and, and rations and things like that are concerned about people not getting enough food. So you get surveys upon the use of milk uh, on rations you put on the rations, then give it to certain categories of the population. So, so there's lots of that kind of stuff going on as well, as well as the kind of all souls group work 
which is looking at things like um, what becomes the Butler Education Act in 44. So you've got lots of those, as you would in any other university, um, lots of those kinds of, of academic contributions um, to the war, but also crucially to the post-war world, which becomes so very, very important. Um, those whose research connects them to poly policy making on international and imperial affairs, very much informed debates about the future of world governance and the evolution of the British Empire. So great use of, say, Oxford experts, as they were regarded at the time, on, say, the future of India and the possible resolution of that most urgent of the imperial problems at the time, the future of political relationship between Britain and in India that the British still hope is going to remain within a Commonwealth fold and not become an independent, totally autonomous state post-war. So in a war that demanded the support of all individuals, communities and institutions, the university and its members rallied to the cause, while overseas, of course, Oxonians deploy an active service, sometimes directly related to their studies or extracurricular activities. One of the things I'm not going to do in the book is just pick a load of Oxonians who did stuff overseas, because that would be as pointless as saying, right, here's a study of people from Leeds, and that one was in the British Army, that one was in the embassy. So I don't want to do that, but there are some interesting strands, for instance, of the use of, again, I repeat, other universities doing the same thing. Um, so there might be Oxford geographers, or people in their student days who had been on expeditions. So people who've been to the, on the 1932 you know, Greenland expedition, um, they're often then drawn in and their expertise is brought into maybe SOE kind of operations. So when, just as an example, when the British are looking to put behind enemy lines forces led by the Australians into places like captured Borneo, you go to people like Tom Harrison, who as an anthropologist undergraduate walking around Oxford barefooted in the early 30s, has been there before. So, so those kinds of things are quite, are quite interesting, but a subset. You get it also with, with operations in the Antarctic. So when the British are doing operations in the Antarctic to sort of forestall German use of Arctic bases, you will often get people who have been on Arctic expeditions as part of the university's Explorers Club and that kind of thing in the 30s. Um, so all of this takes place while Britain itself is enduring enemy bombing and facing the prospect of invasion and defeat. And I think that's a really important thing is that, you know, we, we, we get a sense sometimes that... Uh, you know, Oxford wasn't bombed, so it had an easy war. Well, you, know, you don't have to be sort of the east end of London to have had a tough war. And the fact is that even in 1942, you, the Oxford's opening air raid shelters. In 42, the Bodleian is moving treasures to salt mines um, um, for better security. So, so even in 42, when now with hindsight, we know that the threat of, you know, proper carpet bombing and invasion has passed. That isn't clear at the time. Of course, even at the end of the war, with the kind of new rocket technology that the Germans are developing, the threat from the air remains a real one. One of the most, um, I suppose, touching accounts I can was this odd book. It was written by the Mansipal of Brazenose. He, he, he's the butler to the, what's, the, what's it, Brazenose? Is it a master or warden of Brazenose? Whoever the head of the house is at, at BNC. And he's a guy called Albert Thomas, and he publishes his memoirs in, in I think, 45. And there's one point, he, he's living in a flat on the high street, just over from that facade of the front of Brazenose. And, and he said the darkest day for him was when he actually plans to kill his family and, his, um, and himself for fear that the Germans are coming. He's got this plan, he's got these really, really great bottles of liquor from the um, from the Brazenose cellar, and he's desperate that you know that the Germans won't get their hands on these things, and so he says, "My grimmest days when I actually made my plan of what drinks I would give out and where in a cellar uh, I would end the lives of my family." And again, that's, that's not him being melodramatic, as he says pluckily earlier on in the book, "I killed my fair share of Germans share in the First World War," but just as a measure of how people felt, just not knowing what was to come, and that kind of turmoil and trauma would have been. You know, sort of shared anywhere, anywhere in the UK. You simply don't know what's going to come. Um, I should just mention war degrees because I was asked about this the other day, and uh, um, to give a precise idea, and this is quoting from Paul Addison, who's got it off pat farther than I have. So what happens is the university is able to carry on functioning. 
Um, though there are those concerned, particularly 1940, that it won't. And there are those like Maurice Bauer, the head of Wadham, urging Lindemann, because of his ear to Churchill, to get the university shut down, just shut it down, get men and women into the armed forces, let's win the war, universities to go for us. Um, but the war degrees are what are adopted. So what happens is under these regulations, I'll just read this, most undergraduates would now have to leave after a year. This raised complex questions of academic qualifications in wartime. The underlying principles agreed in outline in Michaelmas 39 were simple enough. Undergraduates who faced the call up were to be examined on the basis of a shortened curriculum and provided they satisfied the examiners would obtain a special certificate. This, together with a period of military service in lieu of residence, would qualify the holder for a war degree. But this was not to be confused with a peacetime honours degree. At the end of the war, the holders of a war degree would be entitled to return to Oxford and convert it into a full honours degree. So what happens is faculty boards rapidly institute short and endless courses based on sections. One term of course is examined at the end of each term. In each section, it was possible to obtain a pass or a distinction. The shortened course consisted of three sections and students were allowed to count the first public examination prelims as one section. After passing all three sections, which it was expected would occupy three successive terms, you would get your certificate. So that was only you would then come back after the war and, and finish off. From December 42, entry was further restricted because obviously the age of conscription is coming down. Because from December 42, entry was further restricted to those under 18 at the time of matriculation. This would have drastically reduced the number of male undergraduates, but for the fact that from 42, the university agreed to introduce short six month courses, free of normal entry requirements for service cadets. So short courses in which military training was combined with part-time study bears little relationship to normal honours curricula. And this means that from 1941, Oxford is to a great extent becomes, as Ellison says, part-time training ground for officer cadets. This novel situation and the rules governing who matriculated meant the diversity of background of Oxford undergraduates begins to change. You get famous people like Richard Burton. Uh, minor son in the Ronda, joining obviously what is already quite a, a significant number of sort of you know scholarship working class uh, um, people, but this is upping that that if you like strand in the student body. In December forty one, conscription is extended to women. The terms of their service at first allowed them to spend up to two years at university, with a further year of studying leading to professions or callings of national importance, as it was put. This meant that most women were able to continue reading for a full honours degree. But in March 1943, there the regulations were tightened to restrict entry to women who could complete at least six terms by the age of 20, thus preventing women over 19 from entering, while most of those under 19 would now be unable to complete a full degree course. The result was that from Trinity 43, most women switched sections or parts of the short and honours curriculum like the, like the, the males. Um, I hope some of you can understand that because I find it very difficult to make sense of it. Um, but anyway, the, the important thing is, 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 is that the degree people are getting is really changing massively. You need to come and do it properly later on and pop it up. And also whilst you're doing it, you need to be doing assault course training or going out in dummy tanks or joy or working with the air corps and you've got to be devoting a significant amount of each week to those military activities it also means a rapid turnover of undergraduates uh some of the don't some said terms just stop meaning anything the years because you, you're, you're matriculating people even in hillary and so there's this constant throughput uh of 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 students the number of male undergraduates declines sharply while while the number of women remains constant so as an example Undergraduates in residence in 3839, year before the war, 3,750 men, 850 women. 1942, 1,800 men, 860 women. So basically 2,000 men have dropped out of the, of the annual figure. And this doesn't return until 
that doesn't get back up till the end of the war, understandably. The war also has a tangible bearing on the teaching resources of the university and the colleges. So, you know, they reckon um, um, a quarter of, of, of Oxford's academic staff are absent government work, join the military, that kind of thing. Leads to things like more pooling of resources. It's quite a, uh, um, a, a, a boost for things like more um, um, post-college tuition coordination, things like that, as you would really imagine. So that's that. Um, in terms of military activity, uh, I, I find it quite interesting, the whole thing about Dunkirk evacuations I mentioned the other day. Oxford gets, I think, I think it's, I think it's 9,000 over, over a period in, in late May, early June, about 9,000 of the evacuees taken off the beaches, designated to be dispersed all across the country. About 9,000 come to Oxford, they go up to Cowley Barracks, and then they are, first of all, put on the extended camp they're building in tents, going all the way up to Horsebath, becomes the Slate Camp. Um, but they're also marched through to Port Meadow. So they've got accommodation on Port Meadow for 5,000. And you see undergrad just giving them cups of tea and just seeing these absolutely beaten up individuals sort of being marched around until they are then dispersed to reception units for a bit of recuperation, get rearmed, basically get back in the fight because endangerment is, is, is imminent. Code with Cromwell is, is, is a realistic possibility. Um, and I think the other thing that's interesting is people would have been very aware, people sort of, I think would be very, very aware of the destruction wrought elsewhere, but also particularly on the university collections. So the libraries of the British Museum and Liverpool University each lose half a million items through enemy action. Uh, King's College, where I am, they make the sensible decision to evacuate their collections to Bristol, which doesn't turn out to be very sensible because they lose 100,000 or so volumes when Bristol gets bombed. Um, UCL Library lose around 100,000 volumes through fire and water damage. Um, so, you know, I think that people would be very much aware of, the, of, the, of those kinds of threats. I mean, obviously, the threat to life is the main one, but those threats are kind of like you know, precious books and all of those kinds of things is very, very key. Um, I think the whole thing about Hitler and Oxford, maybe living at Blenheim and my sort of capital here. Found no evidence for it, but I haven't done enough digging yet. Um, well, my next turn is to, is, to, is to be in touch with German academics. I've asked their power specialists, and, and so, so you, you always see it, it's always there, but it's the evidence that it needs that, that is wanting. There's no smoke out far, but I'll be interested to know whether it is just a, 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 you know, a bit of an urban myth. But I think the important thing is that whilst Hitler might have thought that, the Luftwaffe didn't. And the Luftwaffe produced maps in 1940 showing bomb targets all across Oxford. Um, so while some people might have thought that you should save this lovely city, um, there are certain people in the, in, in, in the German air ministry who thought that it was fair game. But this is in particular because of the really important war work that is being done at Cowley, uh, and also just parts of, um, you know, like Lucy's works and places like, place like the Woodstock Road. They're chucking out um, 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 jerry cans, steel helmets, millions and millions of items, as well as engine parts, you know, radiators and things like that, as well as the massive salvage work that's being done up at um paul nash does wonderful paintings of our of this sea of smashed up british and german aircraft you know so you've got miles of 100 100 acres of essentially smashed up aircraft up at cowley which are going to be repaired and returned to frontline service back with britain only about i think it's i think it's, it's only about 40 percent of new aircraft going to frontline units are actually new the rest of them are, are, are retreads. And so this is all happening. Kind of, so, so in terms of Ox being a legitimate target, never mind the dreaming spires, it's a really good uh, a military target. And I think people obviously would have been aware of that, that it wasn't just sort of, you know, hit the thinking, we'll keep the nice quads and the dreaming spires for use later on, especially as these plastering other, you know, equally as notable historic cities. Um, and so I think that that was, that was fair. I mean, a recent book, wonderful book published um, by, uh, well, under the auspices of, of the Oxford Local History Society, it's the memoirs of, uh, I think it's called A Vicar's Wife in Wartime Oxford. And it's a woman called Madge Martin, whose husband was Vicar of St. Michael's at the North Gate, I think it's St. Michael's at the North Gate, down, down on, on Corn Market. And, and, and she, she's not sleeping at night, she's absolutely fearful of, you know, she hates the hideous gas mask that they're fitted with, the 100,000 gas masks are issued. So you get a real sense, as, as, as you would, I'm sure, anywhere, of people not knowing what's going to happen and fearing 
um, the worst. The enormous uncertainties of the early years of the war in particular sharpened the senses like nothing else. Philip Larkin, he's up in St. John's, doing a full three-year degree because his poor eyesight keeps him out, out of the military. He says that the most difficult thing to convey was the almost complete suspension of concern about the future because of the grave uncertainties of war. And um, as a, an Australian up at Maudlin says, it was good to be alive, summer 1940, it was good to be alive even if the world was falling about our ears. While the men were coming back from Dunkirk, we sat in the warm twilight on the lawn in front of the library, listening to Handel's water music. Again, a lot of these references from people who have collected undergraduate uh, uh, recollections of, um, I was talking earlier about the St. Hughes, the, the people, the, 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 the few women who remain within the St. Hughes precinct rather than getting dispersed mainly out to, to Hollywell Manor um, when, when that college was evacuated, that, that they say that, that they wish they had gone with the their fellows who went to other places because they were seeing every day, you know, the, the, the head injuries, people, as everyone like, you know, read English or PPE, actually seeing people who have, um, you know, had, had severe head wounds recovering um, um, was something that, so, so those kinds of things, as one would imagine, are, are common. Um, and the war could seem very real apart from the fighting, I think. Um, friends and relatives die and go missing as they do everywhere else. Uh, you do get some action. There are some bombs dropped. At one point, the, 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 um, the, the city's water is, is knocked out by bombing to the south. Um, you get a Whitney bomber crashing in in Linton Road, killing the crew. Uh, Chapel Malcolm Reeve says that my sister was recalibrating instruments salvaged from crashed aircraft to Cowley Works uh, when she found an airman's foot in a boot still in the plane. Um, so, yeah, a lot of, I suppose, awareness about what's happening more widely, as well as just the kaleidoscope of uniforms people see on the street. It really became a city that where, 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 where uniforms were um, um, much in evidence. And also things like, you know, the ARP, Dig for Victory posters, street furniture, like on Core Market, you'll get signs put up for like, for like American GIs as they're transiting around the, the city. Um, also, the appearance of British restaurants, as you know, these restaurants set up to give people cheap meals on trestle tables, particularly if they got bombed out or just can't afford food. You get loads of them all over the city, they're all over Oxford. Um, and uh, also just rationing of, of, of food in college halls, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, some people have terrible hardships. I, I was amused to read, I think it's, it's, it's one of Paul Addison's um, um, wonderful anecdotes, and that's... Uh, the warden of Warden Morris Bower to use the Daily Mirror as toilet paper, which uh, which is which is which is which is rather splendid. Um, but also just just to bear in mind that, that parts of lights and ebbs. I mean, there were plenty of poor people in 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 Oxford as well. It wasn't all people in 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 gilded cages. Um, so you get plenty of things where people say things like this: a visiting American student, Oxford on a full moonlit night with all artificial illuminations pressed. But sort of a stygian darkness with blackout presents a sight that is utterly unforgettable. The lights and shadows and glorious silhouettes of buildings against the autumn sky, sights that few have beheld. And the thought of any injury befalling these landmarks is so disturbing that one banishes it completely from thought. You get loads of those kinds of references. A.L. Rouse talks about the burster of Christchurch just sort of going out from this room, just sort of crying about nature that could happen to these historic institutions and surroundings. <laughs> and also, I think what's interesting, you get all of this from diarists like um, um, Iris Murdoch. And, and her, the editor of a diary, says that, um, that her wartime letters and diaries, they convey a sense of the process of reaching adulthood during a world war, when everything was unexpected and strange, in an Ox and, and an Oxford student could find herself digging up Port Meadow for cabbages, threading camouflage meshing for tanks in the Worcester Provost's lodgings, and taking care of poor evacuee children from the East End, all of this in addition to regular uh, academic duties. Nina Baldwin, who came up um, in 43, wrote, Oxford slept in a strange and timeless silence. No bells rang in wartime Oxford from clock tower or steeple. And there was almost no traffic. The uncluttered curve of the high, the spires of the colleges slept in the clean mist, 
quiet air as some in old Don's dream of peace. In addition to her studies, Nina found herself inviting American GIs um, based at camps around Oxford to Somerville for tea and working as a waitress at the Red Cross Club that had opened on Beaumont Street. Loads of central buildings, as well as the Reposition College, loads of central buildings taken over or opened up by institutes like the YMC, the Red Cross and things like that as service personnel uh, um, specific establishments. Um, now, I just want to mention a few of these. We also leave some time for some discussion, but there are comments I want to make. First of all, the, the whole the new Bodleian story is a fascinating one. It's been written up brilliantly in the Bodleian Army Record, basically because the guy responsible for looking after it wrote a memoir in the 60s. So, what happens there is serendipity. The building's empty. So, at the start of the war, you've got this massive empty building with reinforced underground floors. It's just brilliant. And it becomes, so it becomes home to the regional headquarters of the Royal Observer Corps. You get the blood transfusion bank I mentioned, you get the Red Cross office in there sending out books to British POWs in Italy and Germany. Um, air raid shelter, but it's most notable thing, what like D-Day maps, Aventry Photographic Library, just chock full of stuff. It's, it was, but it is, it's a big space. Um, but what they do, it's, 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 it's most fascinating thing, is it becomes home to treasures from all over the country. So every Oxford college has got in there its stained glass, its ancient manuscripts, its treasure this and that. But you've also got treasures from the British Library, the British Museum, the V&A, both Houses of Parliament, Royal Botanical Gardens bring all their seed cases up. You just, you've just got this, you've got this absolute, you know, sort of, uh, um, um, depository uh, of, of things from across the country that are brought there for safekeeping. Um, um, it, it was really, really remarkable. And all basically because the building was empty uh, um, and was suitable for, for, this, for this purpose. And so, so that, that in itself is a, is a fascinating story. Um, A.L. Rouse describing the scene in the university in 1941. The life of the streets, even in the old centre of the town, has ceased to be dominated by the university. So many thousands of evacuees and refugees flooded into the area, mainly from London. It is said that the population has gone up by some 20%, perhaps 20,000 people. Then there are all the men in uniform who crowd into this convenient centre by all the bus routes from round and about. Pavements are incessantly crowded. Shopping has become a nightmare. Theatres are packed with unknown faces. As the war wears on, it becomes rarer and rarer to recognise friends. You get a lot of this from the, from the older people who can't get work. You saw the other day, those who attended Kenyon's speech on Wednesday, Tolkien tries out for Bletchley doesn't work. So he's, he's, he's answering ARP telephones in a concrete shelter in, in, uh, in, in, in St Hugh's Gardens, not enjoying it very much at all. Frederick Holmes Dudden, the master of Pembroke, unhelpfully inquired of the Hebdomadal Council what action was proposed to protect, make, to protect male undergraduates against the solicitations of prostitutes in the darkened streets. So it's rather unusual concerns. Often he Bauer, you get this sort of Bauer, that Bauer feels that he, given that he's such a, a, you know, almost like a, a poster individual for Oxford, but no one wants him in a job. So he ends up being 2IC to, to Frank Packenham's Home Guard Company, sort of, you know, sort of exercising uh, young home guardsmen on the, on, the, on the front lawn of Wadham before giving them beer and things like that afterwards. So, so a lot of a, lot of a sort of certain generation, I think, of people find that they just aren't as involved in the war as they want to be. They're not all sort of beverages getting stuck into government work. They are just uh, um, 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 keeping the home fires burning, as it were. I must just finish by just, just going to mention this food stuff, if I may. Um, uh, Oxford, despite its reputation for high living and high table, enjoyed rationing like everywhere else, and an altogether drabber form of existence. It's quite this quite noticed by um, um, less well-to-do students. They quite liked the war because it meant that they weren't having to compete in the same way as fashionable clothes and sort of you know fancy fancy luncheons. Um, because no one was really doing that kind of thing, and even running cars was, 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 was much more difficult. College feasts and other festivities were largely suspended. Petrol rationing meant that people were tending not to run cars, and well-heeled undergraduates forwent expensive and decorated rooms. 
At St John's, coal shortages meant that only a single file was now up the staircase. You get the same story across all the colleges, causing students to work and entertain in the same room. Though getting drunk was common, wrote Kingsley Amos, there were no lavish supper or drinks parties. Amos arrived at St John's in April 41, as he put it, in impeccably proletarian style, being driven over from my parents' house in Berkhamstead by the family butcher in his battered Morris and approaching the wrong way. Assigned a nasty little pair of rooms in the top corner of the front quad, he wrote. Um, it didn't take him long to start moaning about the food. And, and I have to say this, and again, this is from um, the, the, the history of the university. As he helpfully wrote in the kitchen and JCR suggestion book, when I have potatoes in their jackets at home, the jackets are worth eating. Here, jacket and potato are fucking awful. Shop stewarding on the food front, he was soon insinuating that the kitchen staff were profiting and profiteering at the expense of undernourished undergraduates. Give us our cheese ration and stop making the bloody macaroni things. We don't think other members appreciate it. What a fucking hell of a lot of cheese they are missing out on. Um, so usually in, in, in much more decorous terms, the issues with college food of getting sort of like one, one little slice of black pudding on an enormous plate as part of a proper three course meal in, in for example, Pembroke is, is very much part of the picture as of course it is across the entire um, country. And I'm going to leave it there because it will just allow some time for us to, to have a, a chat. Sorry to have gone on for so long, but I hope we've given you a flavour of some of the things. We know really only a fraction of them, but um, there are a whole range of ways in which, like any city or town, during a period of total and global war, the, the effects and the impacts on individuals, on institutions, on what you see every day, what you eat every day, what you think every day, is just what you know, those of us who are old enough to have had, I suppose, these things passed down to us or are aware of the war as a reified cultural presence. Um, and it's very much here, although like every place also has its own peculiar story to tell, uh, um, as every single place, does even the village I grew up in on Bobby Moor had someone killed by a stray bomb led off by a bomber hitting a Methodist church in 1940. It was a, it was a world war. Thank you all very much indeed. Any questions? I'll do my best to answer them, but um, I really can't promise anything. Tom. Well, thanks for the chat. That was, that was great. And um, you're really evocative of what that must be like. And as I was talking, one, one question that came to mind was, whether this um, kind of special relationship, you might say, between Oxford and, and the state that develops in the Second World War, how far it rolls over into the Cold War? Is there something that's being kind of created there that then, you know, carries on into the late 40s and 50s? <clears throat> I think yes. I think that one of the contributors to, to, to Brian Harrison's book, I remember him saying that, you know, the idea that Oxford and Cambridge then, if they pronounced the, the country took notice. So that's why the, the 1933 King and Country debate was seen as so, because, you know, everyone's, it's being reported in the press in Buenos Aires, you know, even though it's just a bunch of callow, you know, students. And so, so, so that, and we're still familiar with that today, are we not? You know, the, the vestiges of that one could say is still very much there. And it'd be useless to deny that. But then it's even more, smaller state, only 20 universities, much more of an interconnection, that kind of thing that David Kenya was saying the other night. You know, it's no surprise that in the 1940s, Bletchley Park was recruiting elite males um, from particular institutions. So was everyone else. It was just the way it was. So, so I think there's that, and there's that kind of, so there's that intimacy of, of state relationship. You see it also quite interesting with, with the um, award of honorary degrees. Because I mean, so there's an article on this, you know, Oxford and honorary degrees and the war. And so even in the 30s, it was almost like an annex of the foreign office. If you want to honor so-and-so, then get them up to the Sheldonian and, 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 you know, and senior and do the business. And you see it's very much used with the, you know, sort of the, the signaling early in the war, say the Czechoslovakian, uh, I'm, I'm head of state, the Norwegian king. And, and so it's almost like, you know, state and university like that, as you're sending out your signals about what the free world is doing and, you know, the people who, there's similarities with Ukraine and, and that kind of thing today. It's just how these things operate. I think, um, but again, what's interesting is, is we can't overplay those things. Um, and, and I think what struck me is, you know, Oxford's really important, All Souls, you know, the Times being the All Souls Parish newspaper and all the rest of it, fine to an extent, but if, if we go too far down that avenue, we can perhaps overlook just how much London is a massive, 
metropolis and centre, and this is an outpost. So you get things, one of the interesting wars on is that the, the people who cycle through, this, this swing door of connectivity of an elite, proximity to, you know, rather like the old thing about um, in, in Yes Minister, where they want to build this main road, you know, sort of, it's all about sort of connections to Bailey College and High Table and all of that kind of thing for people who, are, who happen to be government ministers or senior civil servants. Um, so, so I think that there's, there's a lot of that. And what you will tend to find is, is, is during the war, as, as in other periods, of course, Oxford and the Union, for example, will be used as a platform for, for flying kites. So you get some big policies on colonial affairs, Indian affairs. Um, Churchill's private secretary, John Martin, is, um, is, is, is dating and marries during the war the, the VC's daughter, who at times provost of Oriol. I mean, the changes a number of times in the war, uh, who the VC is. And he, so he's regularly up here either staying with Professor So-and-so in Boar's Hill or putting up the mitre, or usually just staying with the, the Provost of Oriel. I think that's right, I had a, had a house title. And, and so, so he's, he's doing all the high table stuff and all the teas. So, so you can just imagine the kind of traffic of information there before he goes back to the hardcore of you know, dealing with working uh, in, 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 in the Churchill uh, um, um, office. But what I do like is that some of these big wigs who are you know, quite rightly famous names, People in government find them really annoying. Beverage is a classic one. So beverage is really important. Obviously, lots of people, as you know, lots of people in the government, they don't like his report, think he's gone too far, and they've had enough beveraging. And so there's one point when, um, when, when Churchill just says, beverage is trying to get an appointment, very important, Churchill, that Churchill says, leave itself to the war, hey. And so, so even at that kind of lofty level, of, you know, sort of really important connection of academia and policy, and, and those who write about beverage, uh, they, they talk about how, you know, the Oxford link is, is very important. His student days here and the kind of his interest in socialism and various things is, has been incubated. Um, um, and obviously when it comes to, 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 to be head of house at UNIV, it carries on. Um, but the other thing I think that is interesting is you get it very much with um, in, in science and research. So the funding that's coming from things like ICI or the Department for industrial research, science research, I think is what it's called. That kind of links with government and private funding, which obviously the, the science in particular have always relied on, so it's such a long winded answer. This carries on with things like Harwell. Uh, and, and so that kind of, you know, small wheel, Oxford, attached to much bigger wheel. Um, and and the same, with, yeah, same with things to do with the, the Atomore and the, the Americans. So, so I, think, I think you can see it uh, I'm, I'm carrying on. I don't think that which by no means unique to Oxford, but yeah, Oxford's doing it more than, say, you know, Bristol is. Uh, Oxford and Cambridge, obviously, as we know, are in, are in a distinct subset. Sorry, sorry, I'm going to answer. So. Sorry, you haven't spoken very much about conscientious objectors in Oxford. Were there a large number of them? I would imagine with educated people, there may be some people who are against the war or against violence. Sure. Uh, during the war, there are going to be some, I haven't come across their activities, but you'd certainly have in the, in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And, and those kind of people interested in, in sort of peace movement things in, 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 in the 1930s um, are, I think, I think you get a, a huge amount of activity there. Um, and also things like, you know, the wartime phenomenon would be some of the foundations of Oxfam that is very much coming out of you know, as a famine relief in, in, in Europe, never mind f f further away. So at the moment, I'm not, I'm not getting any readings on that, but there are bound to have been some out of the 60, 70,000 people living here. Um, but I think that a lot of these, these, I suppose, big political debates about League of Nations, pacifism, and that kind of thing, have um, have have been played out massively in in in, in the in, in the thirties. Thank you. So I can't give, give you. No, that's all right. Thank you. <laughs> no takers online. It's, 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 it's like a bidding auction. I'm giving off the boat. No, they're coming in for. Yeah, yeah. A, a better question from America. <laughs> Any any other? Yes, please. Did, have you seen evidence that people did come back um, and finish their degrees? I think what's really interesting is that you then get into the territory of post-war boom and the expansion across British HE, which obviously you'll, you'll know all about. And and the um, you get the wonderful disjuncture of um, new undergraduates coming up. I haven't seen a banana. Uh, and and their and their year mates have got sort of moustaches on and cavalry twills and have been sort of you know bayoneting people overseas. So that kind of that that real difference of, of of age groups and experience as 
those come back and as new people carry on, especially as the Butler Education Act is now opening things up, it's a period of expansion. And that's the thing is, is literally you can't cope. It's the struggle to get accommodation. So I'll give you an example, and that is uh, St. John's. Um, the, the new Dolphin building, they want to build that. They want, they, need, they want to get new accommodation up rapidly. Fortunately, the bursar has laid down loads of wood and things like that, so they can begin building new accommodation as soon as the war ends. Lots of other places can't get, can't get the building, so, so nothing would obviously remain a big hole into the 50s because of the war's effect on construction. But St. John's has managed to get a load of materials together, they can stop this rain. But what it does to mitigate immediately is, is that lovely rank of buildings, which used to be of, of, of happy memory, Debenhams, before that Edith and Cavill and what have you, that whole row going from Debenhams Corner up to the Randolph was a hotel called the Oxford Hotel, run by two ladies, Ground Landlord St. John's. In 1945, they want to shut the hotel. So St. John's take it over lock, stock and barrel as a hotel, and they just whack a load of undergraduates into it. So, so dealing with that kind of immediate demand for uh, uh, more and more, more and more places and more and more people. Um, and, and so, yes, they do. But I don't know the percentage. I don't know what the figures are and how many come back who are entitled to to get their honours degree. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. Um, someone I've studied who's uh, Peter Benenson, the founder of Amnesty. He did one of these one year degrees, and then went to Fletcher Park. And then he goes straight into the law at the end of the war. So it's not just that kind of counts against you not having, I don't think you ever gained access to the Imagine on base of all the things you've done and the one that probably was enough to progress. Yes, yes, yeah, enough to progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other, any other questions? Just following on that, that last point, uh, I mean, I think geographer, I'm a geographer, and some of the geographers, for example, went to do town planning, but they went elsewhere because it wasn't really appropriate in Oxford right. times. Right. So you get this link from undergrads, but somehow they've spun up because of their experience during the war. Right. I mean, so I think it's a quite interesting work. To do yeah, there. yes, yes, yes. Mm. We'll have to do that. <laughs> Well, thank you ever so much indeed for coming. And uh, I think there's a cup of coffee, is there? Or... Yes, fantastic. Thanks, sir. Um, yeah, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.